Today is Saturday, the 16th of March, 2024, and we are all gathering on Zoom uh, today to uh, participate in the 123rd session for Mindfulness for Beginners in the English medium, conducted by uh, Nisarvane Forest Monastery, led by Venerable Bhante Homagamu Dhammakusalutheru. I would like to welcome uh, Venerable um, Dhammakusalutheru on behalf of all of us to, to, for today's session. And I would like to also uh, welcome all of you who are joining through Zoom into today's session. Our program will commence with the in-session practice uh, guided by Bhante for all our benefit. And then we will move on to the uh, talk uh, by the Venerable Bhante. And after that, we will um, commence a question and answer session where we will present uh, verbal, uh, written uh, statements and questions and also uh, then uh, the verbal statements or questions for Bhante's advice. After that, we will wrap up the program. So to commence things in today's session, I would like to invite Venerable Bhante to uh, uh, start with the in-session practice. Over to Bhante. Much merits. Thanks, Namanta. Hello, everyone. Today, we'll start with a few minutes of mindful sitting and go into the program. For this, uh, all of us, let's sit in a comfortable manner. Make sure that your posture is balanced. Make sure that you are comfortable. Once you are comfortable, once you are balanced in your posture, gently close your eyes. Notice what you feel in your body. What are the prominent sensations in your body? Some of you might feel the breathing in your body. Let it be as a touch at your nostrils, breath going in and out. Let it be as a movement of your belly. Some of you might feel the seated posture, the pressure on your back. Whatever the prominent sensation in your body, let it be the breathing or the belly movements or the seated posture. Try to keep your attention with that prominent sensation. Try to observe few breath cycles mindfully. Breath goes in and it comes out. Again, the breath goes in and it comes out. When you try this, habitually your mind will go to certain thoughts, memories, future planning. These things will grab your attention. Whatever the things that distract you, they are unique to you. For some people, it's the future. For some people, it's the past. For some people, it's certain, certain other things. When this happens, you can become aware and bring your attention back to the breathing. Again, notice how the breath goes in, how it comes out. Repetitively, the mind goes to certain, certain things. Forget the breath. But repetitively, we try to bring our attention back to the breathing. 
let's try to continue this way for a few more minutes.
Okay, everyone. Now you can open your eyes. Again. So that's just few minutes of mindful sitting. Just to give you an idea. With this method, you can practice on your own. And when you present your experience, we, we can discuss further and how to continue this practice, we can discuss. With that, Namanta, you can take over. Thank you very much, Bhante, and much merit for the uh, guided session. Next, uh, we have the talk on mindfulness uh, for today, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite Fenor Bhante again uh, to come as a talk on the new topic uh, scheduled for today, and I will share the screen uh, for this topic. Over to Bhante again. Okay, everyone. So, uh, today we have a new topic and we'll take some time to discuss this fresh topic and see how we can relate this to our practice. Now, when you face your life, you may have to go through different phases, different challenges you may have to face. So sometimes things don't work out according to our expectations. Sometimes during certain phases of our life, we may have to go through abuse. Various things happen. So when such things happen, in a way there's this method of saving ourselves. We without even knowing, without even thinking, there's this automatic response to these situations, these difficulties in our life. We can simply introduce them as addictions. In a way, it's your mind coping with this trauma that you have to go through. It's your mind coping with the difficulties in your life. So in a way, all of us, we have certain, certain addictions. Some of us, we may be addicted to drugs. Some of us, we may be addicted to different methods of drugs. It's not only drugs or not only those uh, medicines that can get us high instead sometimes by spending so many hours on social media some of us can get high or maybe being addicted to something else some of us can get high so you can see, in a way, this is more like an automatic response. Your mind's way of coping with the suffering in life. It will create certain, certain addictions. And with that addiction, you try to cope with the difficult situations. Maybe it goes back to the childhood. Maybe a childhood abuse. Due to that, due to that history, due to that trauma, you might be caught in an addiction today. So this way we can see it is more like a coping mechanism. It might not be healthy, but somehow it is your mind's way of dealing with things. Right? So when we talk about addictions, Time after time, we try to get rid of them. We, you promise yourself that I won't do this again. But next time when something comes up, next time when you have to go through a difficult situation, again, you go and try to find the comfort of that very same addiction. So this way we can really see how we are trying to find some comfort you, we, through that addiction. It could be food, it could be drugs, it could be being a workaholic, 
whatever it is, we try to find some comfort with that addiction. Whenever you have to go through a rough patch, you automatically go to that addiction. So this way, although you promise yourself that you won't do this again, most of the time those promises are not kept. This happens again and again. Time after time, you try to get rid of it. Time after time, you end up hating yourself. Right? So this way, it won't work. Although you try, although you promise, it won't work. Instead, there should be some alternative method to deal with things like addiction. Especially when you say not to do it, our mind, in a weird way, wants to do that time after time. Even that Bible story, when the God said not to eat from this tree, that very statement was the source of their curiosity. If he didn't mention it, of course there would have been many more trees in the garden, but when somebody tells you not to do something, that very statement will create your curiosity. Right? So when we try to stop doing something, when we force ourselves to stop doing something, when we hate ourselves for doing something, that very forcing, that very hating will give more and more power towards that addiction. That is very natural. That is the natural behavior of our mind. You tell a child not to do something and somehow it will find a way to do that very particular thing. Why? Because your parents, the parents said not to do. Even there's this story about Sigmund Freud. He went to see a nature park with his wife and the son. They spent the whole day traveling here and there. And towards the end day, by the time of the dusk, they came back to the gate. And upon arrival, they realized that their son is missing. So Sigmund Freud asked the wife, now so many places we have visited, we can't go back to each and every place and find him. And sir, did you tell him not to do something during this time? And then the wife recalls saying, yes, I told him to not to go to that waterfall. That I said. Then they went to the waterfall. There was his son. Why? Because the mother told him not to do it. Right? So that way, even the addictions, when we try to stop, when we try not to do, when we try, you know, hating ourselves for doing these things, that very process will create more and more energy towards the very addiction. So instead, you have to be more skillful dealing with these things. You have to find more skillful means to try and get rid of an addiction. Right, so today's topic about that, how to get rid of an of an addiction. So the quote that's in the poster, it will tell you some information. You don't get over an addiction by stop using. You recover by creating a new life where it is easier to not use. That's the way. You can't just stop an addiction by not using. Instead, you have to find an alternative path. You have to create a new life, new interest, new things. So it will be much easier for you to not use. That's the very idea. It's a fork on the road. You, ha you have to select your path. You have to have an alternative path. That way only 
uh, it will be much easier for you to, you know, not get caught in this very addiction. So that's the very idea. Now, very first step of doing this would be being conscious. Without that ability, we can't get rid of addictions. You can't even think about it. If you don't know that you're addicted, if you don't know that there is this obsessive behavior, then of course, you you can't get rid of it. Instead, you have to be more and more self-aware. With that self-awareness only, you can know what your addictions are. Maybe on the surface, you think that you're addicted to certain things. But when you inquire within, when you increase your self-awareness, you realize this is nothing, but I have much deeper addictions, much deeper issues in me. So that way, the very first step would be to become more self-aware. That's what we suggest. As mindfulness, that's what we are trying even being self-aware, it is not easy. You can't simply make a determination to be self-aware and do it. That's not how it works. Instead, with repetitive practice only, you can increase your self-awareness. As mindful walking, mindful sitting and daily mindfulness, you have to practice this. It's a painstaking process. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes energy. But only going through this repetitive practice can you be more self-aware. That's the very idea. So that's why we recommend a few minutes of formal meditation daily. Probably at least like 20 minutes of formal meditation as mindful walking. Then 20 minutes of formal meditation as mindful sitting. At least you start with like 40 minutes daily and continue for some time. What are you trying to do? You are trying to increase your awareness. You are trying to be more conscious. You increase your self-awareness. In order to do that, you might have to introduce this part to your daily life. You do formal practice, formal meditation as mindful walking and sitting daily for like 40 minutes together and you continue with that. When you sit mindfully, when you walk mindfully, you start to see your behavior, the mind's behavior you start to see. Even during today's sitting session, we asked you to be aware of your breathing. We asked you to be aware of your seated posture. Whatever the prominent sensation that was there, we asked you to maintain your attention with that sensation. When you try this, what happens? That experience is unique to each of us. When we try to keep our attention with the breathing, when we try to keep our attention with the walking, what happens? Certain, certain memories come. Certain, certain problems arise. Certain, certain future fears might come. So this way, our mind goes to certain thoughts, memories, incidents. This way, our mind gets distracted. Let me use the word distraction. And going forward, you'll see it might not be the proper word for this. Your mind gets distracted with certain thoughts, memories, things like that. So when your mind gets distracted, that dis distraction is unique to you. It's not common to two people. Instead, it is your own unique distraction. Right? So, repetitively, you can see your mind goes to 
same type of distractions. So in your mind, these distractions are also like addictions. You are addicted to think in a certain way. You are addicted to become fearful about certain things. You are addicted to worry about certain, certain situations. So this way, we can see each of us. We have a unique set of addictions in our mind. Now, when you see this, when you become aware of this, when you experience this in your formal practice, the natural tendency would be to resist it. We say we are getting distracted due to these things. We want to get rid of those distractions. A beginner, they will make that statement. You can see they are saying that if these things are not there, I can meditate. My meditation is troubled because of these things. If I can't, can get rid of these things, I'll be fine in my meditation. But that's a wrong statement. That is not true. Instead, this is the very meditation that you have to go through. You realize these things are the unique addictions at the moment. So you realize that I go to these thoughts. With that realization, with that consciousness, you return back to the breathing. Again, your mind goes to the habitual thing. Again, you become conscious and bring your attention back to the breathing. Again, your mind goes to certain memories, thoughts. Again, you become conscious and bring your attention back to the breathing. So this way, you see the breath becomes the alternative path. Now your mind, it has a habitual path, habitual way of, you know, go, way of the attention flowing. But instead, now you are making a conscious decision. Instead of your habitual nature, habitual path of your mind, you bring your attention to something else. So in a way, you are creating a new life. You are giving your attention to the breathing. You choose breath over other things. You choose the walking body over other things. Not by suppressing the thoughts. Not by suppressing the emotions. Instead, consciously you become aware of these thoughts, emotions. Consciously you choose the breathing among these things. Consciously you choose the walking among these things. Consciously, you choose the bodily sensations among these things. That very training you are doing. Earlier, you allowed your attention to roam freely. But now, you are conscious and you choose certain objects to bring your attention to. So that's the very idea. Some people, they ask, what is the purpose of bringing your attention to the body? What is the purpose of observing the breath? Is there some magic in the breath? They ask. Right? They ask whether there is some magic in the breath. There is no real magic in the breath. What happens is that this is an alternative object. This is an object that is not harmful to you or the others. If you keep your attention with the breath, you will be safe. If you keep your attention with the bodily sensations, you will be safe. So there is no real magic in the breath. But what we do is that we consciously choose breath over the other things. Over the 
thoughts, over the emotions, over the worrying, we consciously choose the breathing. That's what you are doing. That's why we need the breath. That's why we need the bodily sensation. Otherwise, you think that why we pay attention to the breathing. It is an alternative way. It's, it's the new life that we are creating. Instead of those thoughts, instead of those habitual behaviors, instead of those comfortable worries, we create a new life. We choose the breath over other things. So in a way, you are creating a new life in your practice. And when you do it repetitively, when you do it for a few weeks, few months, you realize it becomes easier for you to get rid of those habitual thoughts. It will be easier for you to bring your attention to the body over those habitual thoughts. Still those thoughts are there. Still those addictions are there. But now you become more skillful of bringing your attention to the bodily sensations or the breathing. So now you can see what is mentioned in the court. You can really experience in your practice. For a beginner, it is really difficult to give attention to the breathing over other things. Your thoughts are really strong. They have a lot of energy. They drag you repetitively towards those thoughts, memories, certain, certain things. But with repetitive practice, you become much more skillful. It becomes much easier for you to uh, give your attention to the breathing or the bodily sensations over other things. So in a way, in our practice even, we create an alternative life, a new life we create. With that effort, it becomes much more comfortable. It, it becomes easier for us to bring our attention to the breathing, bring our attention to the walking body, bring our attention to the bodily sensations. So this is the very practice that we are doing. And when we do this practice, we realize now still the addictions are there. Those thoughts are there. Those memories are there. Various things are there. We are not suppressing them. They are there. But among these things, you have the ability to choose your breath. Among these things, you have the ability to choose the walking body. So this way, we exercise our practice. Repetitively, we do this type of a practice. Now, in your life also, this change should happen. That's why we give priority to the practice. Only by practicing this way, you will become more conscious of yourself. You'll become more self-aware. This way you continue your practice. This way you do. And when you continue this way, when you improve your practice, when you become more conscious, you start to realize there are certain, certain addictions in your life. These addictions, you become aware, you know that you are, they are bad, you know that they are hurting you, you know that they are disturbing your day-to-day -day life, but still you can't get rid of them. Still you can't stop them. So we are not asking you to stop. Instead what we say is become more conscious of these things. While, let's say the word, use the word using, while using, 
become conscious that you are doing this while going after certain certain things become conscious that you are doing this while eating unnecessary things repetitively become conscious that very consciousness is what we are practicing what we are recommending with that consciousness you'll have a choice you'll have a choice to give your attention to something else an alternative life a new life you can create it's a painstakingly long process but the consciousness is the key with the consciousness you can choose a different thing over the other addictions the usual addictions time after time your mind goes to them you know sometimes you lose yourself sometimes those addictions win but we try to become more and more conscious we try to select a different thing over the usual habitual addictions so this way in a way in your life also you have to create a new life you can't simply get over an addiction by stopping instead you are creating a new life so it will be much easier for you not to use for example let's take an addiction to the social media or phones the smartphones the smartphones they have become so smart even they can outsmart us that's the thing most of the time that's happening even with the support of ai and those things in future it will be much worse the smartphones they have become so smart they can even outsmart us that's why most people get addicted and when you browse those uh, social media and various things you can see the algorithm starts to read your mind it's it feels like it can really read the habitual behavior it can really read what you enjoy and when you use for few weeks the algorithm will suggest the perfect selections tailor made for you right so that's there so these smartphones these devices they have become so smart it's a new way of living it's a new life it's not the old life these devices they are more like intelligent designs so this is a life among intelligent designs so if you don't know if you are not conscious then it's natural that you get addicted to these things you get caught in these processes right so let's take such an addiction as an example phone addiction right so if you start using the phone let's say you start saying like i'll use like 10 minutes and you end up using it for 2 hours that is the behavior that's how it happens and in the meantime you forget you postpone you 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 avoid doing your necessary things maybe it's the time that you can spend with your children maybe it's a time that you can go outside and you know exercise so this is how it works so this type of uh, addiction now what can we do what can we do somebody was telling me now i intentionally avoid the phone i intentionally leave it at home and go for a walk 
I intentionally go to the garden and do certain certain things so I don't encounter my phone that much. So maybe you will be late to answer your calls, but that's fine. In few hours, you can return them. So this way, you just, you know, intentionally do something, find an alternative way. Right? So what's the source of this? Very consciousness is the source of this. If you are not conscious, you'll get caught. Consciously, we choose something else over these additions. Repetitively, we choose something else over these addictions. That's the same process as meditation. That's why we say the meditation will help you. You have to do that training as walking, sitting, daily practice. Then only you can do these things in your life. And then only you can get rid of the real addictions in your life. So that's a simple example of dealing with a porn addiction. You know that if you start using, you'll spend few hours doing the same thing. So instead of doing it, you intentionally go outside. You spend time. You go forget the phone at home and you go out. So that way, these might be like temporary solutions, but still you consciously make a change. Consciously you create some alternative way. So these things matter. These things help a lot. Even the word, the sublimation. Some of you might even know sublimation. They suggest that that's a positive way of dealing with certain certain negative things. For example, let's take the writer, Harry Potter's Harry Potter book series. The writer, he was suffering with uh, depression, I guess. Depression and poverty. And this was the sublimation. This was the solution for those things. And when you are busy doing something worthwhile, doing something interesting, naturally those addictions go away. So sublimation is using these addictions and creating a new life. For example, a young boy who is suffering with hate, who has a short tempo, he might use that same energy to play a sport. Let's take boxing as an example. Inside the ring, you can release your head. But when you come outside the ring, you have to behave yourself. That's the only change that will happen. You can't express your head everywhere. When you are inside the ring, you can express, you can let it out. But when you come outside, you have to control yourself. You have to behave yourself. So these things are valid ways of dealing with an addiction. So you can see it's not about stopping. It's not about, you know, getting rid of. Instead, you consciously create a new life, being busy in a new life. That way you can get rid of probably get rid of is the not 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 the correct word instead we can say it will be much easier for you to not use that's the way right you create a new life you create a, a, you be, keep yourself busy with new things and it will be much easier for you to not use so that's the real way that's the proper way you have to be conscious and you have to select an alternative path instead of the usual habitual path. So that's the very idea. You can practice this. Initially, you can practice this in your meditation. 
then gradually you can extend it towards your daily life and try to see how you can get rid of the addictions in your life using these alternative ways alternative methods bringing your attention to something worthwhile giving your priority to something worthwhile so that way you can it will be much easier for you to not use even in meditation those habitual thought patterns those habitual worries they won't disappear instead it becomes much easier for you to bring your attention to the breathing among these thoughts the thoughts are still there the memories are still there the worries are still there but they don't have so much power as they used to have that's the change that's the change that will happen those things are still there but they don't have so much power that is the change that we need with that change it will be much easier for us to not use and that's it for today thank you for listening thank you very much panthi for excellent advice through the uh, talk there uh, next we have the question and answer session and uh, i would like to invite arusha to commence with the uh, uh, question and answer session and i will share the screen for the uh, beginners guide uh, instruction setup thank you namaste avasara ibante um so before uh, reading today's reports um namanta should i talk through the beginners guide is that yes like yes briefly if you can yeah that's fine thank you um so yes so the the guide here is presented uh for those of you who may be new uh to this uh practice but also as a refresher to those who uh have been attending regularly um so the first step uh in uh beginning with mindfulness uh is to watch the the two videos on mindful walking and mindful sitting to get some basic instruction on the practice and uh to understand the the training that we are following and having watched the videos uh you should allocate a, a small time daily uh to practice and establish a, a regular practice as far as you can uh and over time hopefully growing and developing that practice uh to a point where you have completed at least 2 hours of each practice walking and sitting in total um once you have done that uh we recommend and invite you to share your experiences by writing uh, a reflection report uh which could just be your experiences but it could also include a question um and you can write your mindfulness experience uh separated into mindful walking and mindful sitting experiences describing what you felt uh during those experiences uh the nature of the walking um the sensations on the feet for example uh pressure points on the soles the shifting of the body weight and similarly in sitting the nature of the posture sensation of the breath and the, at the nostrils and so on and by writing that report uh you are reflecting on your practice and you can share that practice with us uh through the google form linked here or by email uh, at the address beginnersnv@gmail.com and these reports are uh, will then be read out uh for bante to hear at these sessions uh, every week and bante will be able to offer some insights and guidance on how to develop your practice and then you should continue your mindfulness practice according to the advice given uh, by venerable bante and then you can uh, continue to uh, report future experiences uh, and get further advice as the sessions progress and finally just to note that all the recordings from these sessions are available on the nisarna mane website So that is the guide um and with that now I will uh read the two reports that have been received uh for today's session. 
The first report, Bhante, is from an adult. Mindful walking. Walked indoors on wooden floor. Firmness of floor against the feet noted. Knew the whole body was moving by the way the weight shifted from one side to the other and feeling of cold air touching the face, neck and hands. Placing feet on the ground, mostly prominent on wood, but while feet moved through a soft carpet, is known by sinking into warmth sensation. Partway through the walking, there was an urge to walk backwards. Mind gave in to the urge. Noted the increased alertness in walking backwards, including slower pace, and that the toes were placed first, followed by the sides and finally the heels. Walked for 35 minutes. Alertness continued for a while after the walking session. Mindful sitting. Sat on the low stool. After a body scan, breath noticed around nostrils, but that sensitivity disappeared in a brief period. Knew that the body was breathing, but could not feel the sensation anymore near nostrils. Although thoughts, memories and feelings also appeared in mind, there was no interest in exploring or following these. Mind was content just to be. Sensation of breath reappeared and disappeared in a cyclical manner. There was a sensation of time slowing down and a lighter feeling in the body. Sat for an hour. Calm feeling continued after the sitting session. Mindfulness during the day. Noticed a calmer shift in mind with recent changes made to the work routine. Chose to work four days a week with Wednesdays off for a couple of months. Still getting used to the idea and know this is adding well to the work-life balance. More time to listen to Dhamma talks, for walks, for rest and to breathe. Yes, this is giving breathing space. Family notices a change too. Less rushing around, less agitated and a bit more quality time with them. So far, so good. Of course, the... <laughs> Excuse me. Of course, the irritations, annoyances... Various wants and urges arise, but it feels like the mind has more time and space to see each of these for what they are, instead of avoiding or suppressing them and speeding over to the next thing. The more these are watched, the less power it seems to hold. A couple of instances at work, as well as in personal life, would have easily aroused unhealthy reactions, but now the presence of mind arises quicker and therefore allowed a better option to be chosen. Even when formal practice may be missed occasionally, the option of being mindful with activities at hand is becoming familiar. Had a secure feeling about if this was practiced increasingly and if being present was second nature, then whether working, resting, interacting with others or was on deathbed, there is nothing more that may be needed. Dear Bhante, look forward to your valuable feedback. Much merit to you and to the organizers. End of report. Arosha, can you please uh, repeat like last five sentences? Of course, Pante. A couple of instances at work as well in, as in personal life would have easily aroused unhealthy reactions, but now the presence of mind arises more quickly and therefore allowed a better option to be chosen. Even when formal practice may be missed occasionally, the option of being mindful with activities at hand is becoming familiar. Had a secure feeling about if this was practiced increasingly and if being present was second nature, then whether working, resting, interacting with others or on the deathbed, there is nothing more that may be needed. Dear Bhante, look forward to your valuable feedback. Much merit to you and to the organizers. End of report. Okay, thanks. Now, in if I start with the sitting part, now we choose breathing over the other things. We give reference to breath over other mind objects. Right? So in a way, we are creating 
an alternative addiction let's say instead of the usual habitual addictions we create a different addiction it's not harmful it's not harming us so the breath we become addicted to the breath but when practice evolves this addiction will also disappear gradually so that's what you are experiencing in the sitting you kept your attention with the breathing but when the practice evolves the breath disappears so that you can take as a positive a good omen the breath is not there the body might be breathing but the perception of the breath is not there right so that that's a good good uh, change in your practice because if you keep holding on to the breath then that's not the true peace you have to let go of everything in order to let go of everything you have to let go of the breathing as well but that happens naturally so uh, comfortably so peacefully in the practice so this is how it happens so next time when the breath returns you don't have so much attachment towards the breath because now you know the breath is not so much reliable it might again disappear after a while right so that very training is important repetitively you do this and with time you are not relying on the breathing even you simply know how to continue your mindfulness without an object of mindfulness simply the mindfulness continues without a particular object of mindfulness thoughts come sounds come bodily sensations come various memories come among all these things you are able to continue your mindfulness right so that's the way that's the practice and regarding the comment or the statement about the work life balance now now there is this story it's about uh, venerable achancha and one of the people came to meet him and asked this question it's a in a way it's a weird question but the bante answered this question in a insightful manner the question was why are we born as humans that was the question the nachancha answers not to be born again not to be born again that that's that's why you are born as a human not to be born again right that was his answer so in this life why are we born we are born as humans the very purpose the real purpose of being born as humans is not to be born again that's the real purpose but when we think about our life we do everything else except for this one we give priority to the priority to all the other things except for this one that's how our priorities are that's why work is so important to us that's why earning money is so important to us right so we do everything else except for the real reason why are we born not to be born again that's the real reason that's the real purpose of this life but instead of that everything else so we are doing okay now in your statement you are see, saying that i i preferred my peace over earning money i preferred my peace over you know being busy that's a positive change that's a positive change and you see the effect of it your family members notice you feel incremental levels of peace within so that's a good change maybe in few months you you may have to go back to the old schedule that's fine but at least you have made a choice to become uh, peaceful within you have made a choice to 
prefer, you have given a preference to the peace over other things. So that's the very idea and that's the very purpose of this life. Find lasting peace within. That's the very purpose. There's nothing greater. But whatever we are doing except for that one, those things are out of the topic. And in money, helpful, but out of the topic. Not the real priority in life. Raising children, of course, good, but not the real priority in life. Enjoying, traveling, various things, good, fun, but not the real priority. So remember that story, why are we born as humans? The answer is not to be born again. That's what he said, not to be born again. That's the real purpose of being born, right? So that's the very idea of this practice. You have to give priority to it. And towards the latter part of your statement, you are mentioning that even on your deathbed, if your mind has this peaceful nature, I'm sure you'll be fine facing it. What happens to most people is that they don't do their real purpose in life. They keep postponing, they keep avoiding. And on the deathbed, they had to face the reality, the reality of their mind, the thoughts, the emotions, everything, burning feelings, sensations, memories, fears, ex extreme pain in the body, right? So everything you have to face suddenly on your deathbed. Can you die peacefully? Right, so in meditation, what we do in a way we prepare ourselves for the death that you have to everybody has to go through, everybody has to face it. We don't know when is the time, probably the next moment would be your time. We have no guarantee, right. We think that I live this many years. That that's only in your mind, a delusion in your mind. In reality, there is no guarantee. You have to accept that. Next moment could be yours. We don't know. Data says every second, two people die in this world. So you can wait a second and check yourself whether you are still alive. Alive. Just, you know, poke yourself and see whether you are still alive. And if you are alive, you can be grateful that you lasted one more second. Two people went, but you weren't selected. Right? Wake up in the morning, check whether you are alive and be thankful that you are alive. Right? Go home and check whether you are alive and be thankful that you are alive. Because every night, so many people, they, they, they receive, they are calling, right? So this, this life is so uncertain, you have no guarantee. And someday, one day, you'll have to go through this reality, the death, right? So if you are not ready, then it will be a real trouble. So this is the very preparation. We, we, we investigate within. We, we feel the deep uh, feelings, states of our mind. We prepare ourselves gradually. And when the time comes, you know it's just another phase of this meditation. Right? So that's the very purpose. Try, thank you for sharing those points. And continue your practice. I'm sure one day when the time comes, you'll be prepared to go through that very experience. Thank you very much, Bhante. The second report is also from an adult. It begins, Daily Mindfulness. This week, after spending the first three days in a calm, happy state of mind, a situation arose where the underlying tendency of anger arose with a vengeance, 
over others not behaving the way expected of them. During the rising of the anger, mind was conscious. It was unhelpful to all parties and resulting in unwholesome results. Aware the anger was due to the strong sense of I. Was able to control the speech only to some extent, but the mind continued in anger. Noted the warmth in body, heart beating faster whilst angry. Noted the surprise both during the episode and as time passed at the severity of the feelings that arose. In order to calm down, listen to a sermon, which was like pouring water on a fire as the anger just dissipated, as the sp priest spoke of dukkha arising due to expecting others to have gratitude for one's actions and expectations of certain types of behavior. The first thing to remember was others would not behave as one wants and that expectations would give a rise, would, sorry, and that expectations would give rise to unsatisfactoriness. He said, when there are no expectations, no anger or disappointments arise. Following this and reflecting on the arising of the feelings and why the mind was back to the happy, calm state. In the following two days, similar behaviors from others were not met with arising of anger, but awareness of the non-self nature of their behaviors as much as the lack of control over the anger that arose during the previous day. With gratitude to Bhante and organizers. End of report. Okay, thank you for sharing. And if you, you may feel like that you failed during that incident, but that's not a failure. Instead, it's another opportunity for you to learn. If you have the right attitude towards these incidents, if you have the noble view towards these incidents, if you have a meditator's view towards these incidents, it's not a failure. And another opportunity for you to grow, another opportunity for you to learn, right? So only by going through such experiences will be better prepared next time. That's what you are saying, right? You, you, you are better prepared. And next time also, sometimes you fail. You fail. So in a way, the most important thing is that you accept failure as a part of your life. Don't expect. You talked about expectations, no? Don't expect to be successful every time. Right? You have to let go of that expectation as well. Then only you can get into the real practice. Otherwise, most of these things are, they are just temporary. That's why in order to get real change in your life, you have to do meditation, continue this painstaking, boring process for some time, for some years, for some months. That way only you can make real change in your life. Otherwise, when you participate in a session, when you talk about the practice, when you listen to Dhamma, your motivation is high. But soon, within few days, you are back to the usual frustration. Again, you motivate yourself by doing something. But these things are only helping temporarily. What we have to do in the meantime, while keeping yourself motivated, is the meditation. That's the real task. That's how the real change will arrive. Right? So you have to continue that very meditation. And if the meditation evolves, the real change will come. That's not temporary. Instead, it's real. It's, it's a real change. And that real change will allow us to face these incidents more skillfully. More skillfully than earlier. But still you'll fail. 
but uh, you are learning, you are growing. That's the very idea. That's the very idea. That is how you can face these challenges. Otherwise, we'll be fine for a few days. Again, we are back to the usual rhythm. Again, we are back to the usual angle. Right? So, you have to make sure that you are continuing with some kind of a meditation, formal meditation and doing it daily. Doing it daily. And that way these incidents they become learning opportunities today you fail today you lose yourself but tomorrow it will add more skill to your practice tomorrow also you will fail but it will add more skill to your practice so this way we continue we continue and when the real change happens you are not even expecting not to fail that's what i said earlier uh, sometimes even the failures they become a part of our life that's the human nature you can't always be happy sadness will follow you can't always succeed failures will follow right so, if we accept both equally, then the, that's the proper way towards lasting peace. Initially, we select the happiness over the sadness, success over the failure. But if we accept both with, uh, with a neutral heart, then that's the true peace. That's the lasting peace. So, we are talking about, you know, deep meditation, but still... That is how it is. That's how it'll it'll be, right? So uh, somebody dear to you, they they come to your life. You are not you know appreciating when they arrive. They go away from your life. They leave you. Still you are not sad. You don't appreciate the arrival. You are not sad up upon the leaving, right? That's the true peace. If you appreciate when they come then of course the sadness will follow. Right? That's the thing. So if you appreciate only success, then when the failure comes, right, it's a frustration. Yeah, so this is the meditation. It it sounds, you know, weird. How can we ac ac accept both success and failure equally? How can we accept happiness and sadness equally? It is not humanly possible, we feel. But with repetitive practice, long-term meditators, they realize even the success or the failure, they too are parts of this human nature. Happiness or sadness, both are two sides of the same coin. Right? So that very realization that very acceptance will come with time, with repetitive practice only it will come, right? So what we suggest, this is a good learning opportunity. Thank you for sharing what you experience. And going forward, continue with your formal practice, continue with your meditation. And that's how you can do lasting impact, lasting change. Thank you very much, Bhante, for those insights. Much merits to you. Um, now we have a little bit of time if anyone would like to ask uh, questions, either based on the talk today or uh, on the uh, practice reports and, and the reflections shared by Bhante. Uh, this is an opportunity. If you raise your Zoom hand, we can invite you to ask your question. While, while people are thinking about a possible question, uh, I would like to ask a question, Bhante, if that's okay. Bhante, um, your talk uh, very usefully highlighted this importance of making, making it easier to, to live uh, you know, a life, uh, a new life separated from, from the addictive behaviors we might have. And it reminded me of uh, some 
something I read by a, a behavioral psychologist called BJ Fogg, who talks about the relationship between motivation and the ease of doing something. And so if something is easy to do, even if we don't have much motivation, it, it turns into action very easily. Whereas if something is hard to do, we, we need to have a lot of motivation in order to turn our intention into action. And what I think what I understood from what you said is that it's important to have create ways that the our those positive behaviors, good uh, wholesome behaviors are easy to do and therefore require little motivation to become part of our lives and become become the norm. But I was curious, Bhante, if you if you could share some thoughts on the role of making unwholesome behaviors harder to do and therefore to to make them so to it, the role of creating kind of friction uh creating obstacles um in our lives to to try and make the addictive behavior harder to do and therefore less likely to turn into action thank you Bhante. yes uh thanks for that that's a good point now Less motivation when it is easier to do. You can easily uh, do something, uh, get uh, active towards something. But the hard things, uh, you need a lot of motivation, right? So that's why even they say like, break your gigantic goals into small, small steps, bite-sized pieces, right? That's the very idea. How to eat an elephant bite by bite. That's the way you eat one bite at a time and you simply continue. That's the way to eat an elephant, right? So even when it comes to mindfulness for a beginner, mindfulness, it feels like something impossible to achieve. Even I felt like that when I started. <laughs> I felt like this won't work, right? So the, it's it feels like impossible. But you have to take it easy uh, and just one bite at a time. Try. Five minutes of sitting can you do? That's enough for today. Right? Tomorrow it will be another fresh day. Can you try a few more minutes of sitting? One time a child from a Satipasala, probably like 11 years old, even younger maybe. She asked me, how how can I sit for 10 minutes? I can't do. Then I asked her, how, how, how long can you sit now? She said that uh, she can only sit for two minutes. Right? So I suggested that tomorrow, sit for two minutes and 30 seconds. 30 seconds, it's not so hard, no? So sit for 30 seconds more tomorrow. And the after tomorrow, add another 30 seconds. Then within a few weeks, she came back and said, now I can comfortably sit for like 15 minutes. Right? So that's how it is. Bite-sized pieces. Bite-sized pieces of mindfulness. Okay? That way we, we can make sure whatever the gigantic, the goals seems or goals appear, mindfulness appear, we can gradually move towards that direction, right? That's that's another thing that came to my mind listening to you. And finally, uh, how to make unwholesome things harder to do, right? How to make wholesome things easier to do? That's a good question. Now, the way to do that is to transform your mind. Now, if your mind is unwholesome, then it will be easier for you to do the unwholesome things. If your mind is unwholesome, it will be more harder for you to do the wholesome things. Well, naturally it comes. The unwholesome things come naturally. That is your habitual behavior, right? Now, there are certain people, they can lie without thinking. Why? That has become habitual in their mind. No intention needed. No intention needed to lie. Naturally, the lying comes. Right? And some people say, since it is no, there is no intention, it is not a sin. 
completely wrong because you have trained yourself to lie over and over again, it becomes the second nature to you. It becomes habitual to you. So it's a really dangerous situation. You lie without even realizing. Lies come naturally to you. But what happens when you improve yourself little by little, when you make your mind wholesome little by little, when you continue with your meditation little by little, one day you'll reach a point that still you you lie. But you have to put some effort towards lying. Now you have become more truthful in your words. If you want to lie, you have to put effort. Now the lying doesn't come naturally to you, habitually to you. Right? What happens? The mind changed. You made a more wholesome mind within. And with the wholesome mind, still you lie, but you you need to put some effort towards that. It, It won't come naturally to you. And you behave yourself for a longer period and you'll reach a point where whatever comes to you, the words are true. You become truthful. That becomes your nature. Your mind is wholesome. That's why they say when you are not lying, when you speak the truth, you don't have to remember anything. That's a very nice saying. That 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 saying it made a huge impact to me. You don't have to remember anything if you if you are saying the truth. You don't have to remember. If you are lying, then you have to remember. Do all the calculations. I told this one to this person on this day. Then I told something else to that person on some other day. Right. So your mind becomes really complicated. Why live in such discomfort? Why torture yourself like that? Right? If you speak the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Whoever comes, whatever happens, you speak your heart, you speak the truth, and people will find the connection. Last week or the month before, he told this, and today he's telling this. It, 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 they can find the connection easily because you are truthful. Right, so to answer your question, Arosha, I think you have to transform your mind. Make your mind more wholesome and as a result, the unwholesome things would be harder to do, right? Sometimes they would be impossible to do when you achieve a certain level of wholesomeness within Right, impossible to do. I'm adding the word impossible to do because you have achieved, you have reached a certain level of wholesomeness within. Now, people talk about the violence, unwholesome acts in this world. What is the source? What is the root of it? It's the unwholesome minds, it's the violence in your mind that results as a violence in the world as unwholesome acts in the world. So without transforming the within, you can't transform the outside world. No amount of rules, regulations will do. Right? No amount of technology or the surveillance will do. Right? They'll find more unique, creative ways to the say, do, to do the same unwholesome things. Why? Because the mind, it has the nature the unwholesome nature, right? So if you want to change the world for better, you have to change the mind first. Start within. Don't think about the family members, right? (laughs) When we talk about these things, people, they think, okay, I have to correct my family members. No, start within. That's the proper place. Change yourself first. Change your mind for the better. Create Create a wholesome mind. As a result, the entire world will be wholesome it will have the impact so that's the idea so if you want to make the unwholesome things harder you have to change the mind Uh, wholesomeness it should be the natural nature of your mind then of course the unwholesome things would be much harder to do Um, i hope i justified your question much my response yes that that was a, a very helpful uh, response and much much more to 
uh, consider and, and put into action as well. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Samantha has put a, a, a comment into the chat that uh, also could the happiness of a wholesome mind itself be motivating? It, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, I guess, is the question. Yes, we won't call, call it exactly happiness, but but the peace within that that very that very nature, the peace within, uh, could be a real motivator in order to move towards the same direction, right? So that's why even like those bodhisattva stories, they talk about this momentum. It is about creating the momentum. Temporary, you fail sometimes, right? But you continue that momentum, right? So that that very peace within, we we wouldn't really call it happiness. It, it's a feeling of satisfaction, contentment, peace, right? So that that very nature will motivate itself, of course. When you when you feel the con- comfort within, when you feel the peace within, let's say a meditator. Right, we talk about addictions today, right? Addictions today. So let's take a meditator. If if they really do few weeks, few months of meditation, it becomes an addiction. Right? It becomes heroin to them. Right? So in a way, meditation too is a drug. It too is a addiction. And that very drug that very addiction will get rid of all the other addictions. This drug is so strong, it will get rid of all the other drugs. Actually, it's an interesting topic, you know, when we think about meditation, when when other people share their experiences about drugs and meditation, when we get so much information, in a way, the drugs, they reach certain states of your mind with with the help of chemicals. Chemically assist your mind towards a certain level. Now let's say heroin, it has a certain effect. Then marijuana, it has a certain effect. Meth, it has a different effect, right? So these different, different sages, different, different uh, mental states, we go through in our meditation. Right. Sometimes you are you become you know a heroin addict. <laughs> Sometimes you, you, it becomes like a meth feeling. Right. Sometimes it becomes a marijuana kind of a, a states. Right. So these different states we really go through in our meditation. What happens is that in meditation you know how to reach this state of mind. It is not chemically assisted. You know how you started. You know how how to go back to the original position, return back to the uh, present moment, right? That way. You start with the breath. You end with the breath. This is the practice, right? So in a way, this too is uh, is a drug. This too is a drug. And this drug will get rid of all the other drugs. Or oh, this too is a, is an addiction. This addiction will get rid of all the other addictions. That's the very idea. Don't think though those experiences that people chase using chemicals, they are not foreign to a meditator. Long time meditators, if you do it daily, you start to experience these mental states without chemicals. That's the magic. That's the magic. Through the practice, it is not harmful. So in a way, freely and risk-freely, we get the drug effects in our meditation. No risk involved, right? No money involved. Freely, risk-freely, we get the drugs in our meditation, right? So that's the way. That very motivation, when you start to experience, you realize you can't live without it. You become so addictive to this very drug or the meditation and you you can't live without it. I think that's what Samantha is talking about. Much merit, Samantha. 
I notice now we are uh, beyond the allotted time, and I don't see any other hands up or questions. Uh, so I'll draw the uh, Q and A session to a close and hand back to Naaman to, to end the session. Much merit. Sir. Thank you, Arusha. Much merit, and thank you for uh, for uh, guiding us through the question and answer session. And my much merit, and many thanks to Venal Bante as well. That was a great discussion. Uh, with a lot of uh, in-depth um, evaluation of uh, 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 guiding oneself uh, with mindfulness, and as you as you rightfully said, it is a, a drug. It is also a drug without any harmful effects or without any uh, toxicity uh, moving into your mind or body. In fact, actually removing any toxicity in your mind or body over over long term. It's a wonderful drug in that sense. So. Uh, we are concluding today's session. I would like to uh, associate all gains merit, gain merits with uh, Venerable Bhante Homagamu Dhammakusulatero for representing Nisaranwane Forest Monastery and uh, allowing us to learn many uh, insights on uh, on the practice of mindfulness. We wish these merits will uh, uh, cause Bhante to have a, uh, a lead a, a prosperous life in terms of uh, mindfulness practice and uh, achieve Bhante's own objectives. Furthermore, we would like to associate these merits with the chief abbot of the Nisaranane Forest Monastery, the most venerable Bhante Udairigam Dhammaji Mahatheru, and we wish him uh, long health, and uh, and we wish that his own mindfulness objectives uh, will, will be fulfilled by the power of these merits. Furthermore, I would like to thank and pass on these merits to all the organizers of this program uh, who are uh, uh, working towards uh, maintaining this program each week and at a high level of quality. Thank you and may these merits uh, lead you to uh, achieve uh, uh, more, uh, develop and uh, uh, sustain mindfulness practice over time and reap many benefits into the future. I would also like to thank all of you who have joined through Zoom and through the Facebook live stream. You have provided, you are providing us a continuous uh, justification to um, maintain this program so thank you and i pass these merits and wish that uh, you are all able to um, uh, gain uh, apply and uh, nourish your own lives uh, with these mindfulness uh, insights and practices and flourish into the future in your lives so uh, the program will run next week as well uh, this is a weekly program format so uh, sri lankan time 1 pm is the start time for the program I would like to see all of you joining next week as well. We would be uh, uh, continuing the program next week, same time. And I would like to wish you all a happy and mindful week ahead where you are able to practice and report, provide us reports. And also many thanks to the uh, two uh, people who sent the reports and also to Arusha for his, uh, Arusha and Samantha for their ver verbal questions. Uh, we would meet you again next week. I will end the Zoom session now. Thank you very much, everyone.